Cycling. For me, it's not about how fast or how far you can go. It's the ultimate means for adventure. I am grateful that my dad patiently taught me since a young age how to bike, and suddenly my adventures ramped up in pace. Some of my fondest memories with my brothers were made making features and jumps, nearly breaking our necks in the process. At 16 and 17 years old, I would beg my parents just to let me take my bike on a long adventure. Not to share as to where, just to go. The summer I turned 18, my friend Mike and I got our bikes down to southern New Jersey where we did a 1,000 kilometer stint along the east coast of the US. We didn't really know what we were doing, and boy did we ever wing it. That was a taste of the lifestyle, and I was hooked. You know things are really about to get interesting when you see this. And it took four years to finally wake up one morning sometime in the winter months, look at a map in my room, and decide it was this summer that I was going to do it, crossing my home country, Canada. Growing up, I remember my grandmother, Giselle, fading away faster than I could wrap my head around. This disease was overtaking her. And in the winter of 2011, when I was 15, she passed away from cancer. It felt as if there was nothing I could do. When you're so young and you don't fully understand what's happening, sometimes you never really get to say I love you properly before it's too late. In 2017, my grandfather had a sudden re-diagnosis of bladder cancer at 98 years old. It got me thinking again. How do you tell someone that you love them? Do you give them your time? Do you give them a hug? Do you give them a gift? I knew it was time for me to do a ride in Gisela's honor and in support of him too, his battle. So I went over and told my grandfather about it and he seemed pretty stoked. <laughs> My mission was to fundraise in their honor, so I picked two charities which I believe in. The Sick Kids Foundation raising funds for research and care for kids with diseases like cancer, and World Vision on an initiative to bring clean water around the world. As part of the team, I raised money through the charity's websites for which I had a goal of $8,000 around one dollar for every kilometer. So I did two weeks of preparation, bought a kind of proper second-hand touring bike out of the back of this guy's van, booked a one-way ticket to St. John's, Newfoundland, and just sent it. Enter Newfoundland, the first province out of Canada's 10 provinces I plan on crossing on the trip. On June 14th, I landed at St. John's Airport with little more than a bike, four panniers of camping gear, and an ambition to cross Canada self-supported. Even before I started biking west, I was hosted by some family friends at the Allens, north of the capital, who helped me get some final gear items and fed me the kind of food I was going to be missing for months. All right, that's the last time sleeping in a house till I don't know when. After so. saying my first goodbyes, I biked through the capital, St. John's, to the easternmost point in Canada, Cape Spear. This 
where I camped. I'm at the easternmost point in Canada. This is a pretty serious moment for uh, any biker actually enjoying this journey. It's dipping the rear tire in the Atlantic, and then officially starting the journey. My right foot is soaked, so is my back tire, and uh, that's one of the last times I see the Atlantic. These were the two first interactions I had with complete strangers on my trip. The tailors from their family-owned fish market paid my entire grocery bill and gave me a lobster for supper. A freaking lobster! How not to eat lobster 101. Fresh lobster. My name is Dave Bolden. That evening, at the first door I knocked at, this guy named Dave Boland gave me a roof over my head for the first night. This is the Canadian way to me. It's one of hospitality and kindness. And this was my way of really putting it to the test. When a complete stranger comes up and asks to camp in your yard, how would people react? I've heard so many stories, but couldn't wait to live out the truth about Canada's hospitality. I'm biking across Canada. Thanks, man. Listen, Appreciate it. Take care of yourself. Be safe. Yeah, we'll do. The sun's just coming up. 5.30, I'm on the road. It was foggy. Very foggy. This place is home to the foggiest place on Earth, and weather-wise, some of the most demanding biking conditions I would have to bike on this trip. First one, boys. Now I'm about a kilometer out from Terra Nova National Park and all of a sudden I see this my foot. There she goes. <laughs> and yeah, this is not good. Hopefully I can get this back on or else it'll be a one-legged race all the way to BC, boys. My visibility was often limited, but it didn't affect my goal that I had set in mind since the beginning. The sight of dipping my front tire into the Pacific Ocean, no matter what it took. Like this many things are going right. This many things are going wrong. Like my knee's done. Uh, I'm. I didn't get to where I wanted to yesterday because the wind. The tire blew. My patch earlier wasn't good. They make a new one. But like, all that's given me experience in like how to more efficiently do my bike maintenance. Uh, it's teaching me like responsibility. I'm realizing that stuff is gonna take longer than I expected. I'm only letting my own laziness get in the way of where I want to go. Five days into the trip, I'd already encountered my first and probably biggest setback. My left knee blew up in inflammation. Got my knee iced. Patellar tendonitis, likely from biking too hard, too fast. The rest of Newfoundland consisted of a whole lot of headwind, rain, and my first radio interview on the trip. Great Canadian Cycle Challenge, and we're going to find out more about this in, in just a few moments. Uh, uh, Timmy, where are you located right now? Uh, right now I'm uh, in the outskirts of Gander, just camping. Although it was June, temperatures dropped to one degree Celsius in Deer Lake, where for the first time in my entire trip, I paid for a roof over my head because all I had was a summer sleeping bag to save weight. Northward, just over the mountains, Grossmore National Park lay, waiting for me to explore it. Throughout Newfoundland, I encountered the kindest of people and learned the hard way that, indeed, they do have the worst jokes in the whole country. Jill, nice to meet you. <laughs> it was time to take the ferry from Newfoundland to Canada, as I say. Found a place to crash on the boat and promptly slept the rest of the way to Nova Scotia, bud. It's Canada Day. I woke up in a bush 
to my second province of the trip. Got handed 20 bucks from complete strangers, so I must have looked pretty scraggly. Planning out this trip, one of the things that could have potentially held me back was my fear of missing out. And I really felt it on July 1st, as I spent Canada Day in Bedeck, Nova Scotia, hundreds of kilometers away from my closest friends who have always watched Canada Day fireworks with. During the hottest heat wave of the summer, I biked down Cape Breton Island, collecting funds, making friends along the way, and ended up in Antigonish. I had no idea who put up this sign, but it ended up being some family friends, the Martins, who were giving me surprise encouragement along the way. After cycling for hours in the hot sun, something like that can make a big difference. Then, New Glasgow, where I met up with Kylie. She brought me cliff diving to cool off in the heat wave. With amazing hospitality from her parents, the next morning I left late because of their amazing breakfast and had to bike like a madman to barely make it to the PEI ferry in time. Enter the red, dirt-covered, quaint Canadian province of Prince Edward Island. I trace its beautiful south shore from east to west till I hit its capital. Charlottetown. And did I ever fuel up in social interaction? The nightlife is very concentrated on this one street and teeming with life. I even got a bouncer to be my own bike security guard. It was great. You know, this guy watched my bike all night till 2 a.m. Thanks, bro. No worries. You want to come with us to get pretend? Meeting people who I enjoyed live music with, I shared my story with everyone I could and even got a roof over my head. I hit an amazing part of the trail in Hunter River and was at a place where I was finally doing a conglomeration of many things that I love. Creating video to inspire people to get outside and cycling. Traveling to PEI really felt like I thought it would be. Biking past small communities and meeting friendly, hospitable people who care about others and love to listen. At one point on the trail, a fisherman who saw me with a drone out kindly asked me for an aerial picture of his house. Turns out, he had just come home from a good catch and traded me the photo for three fresh trout that he just caught. Hi, Mom. How are you? I'm well, well, well. How are you? Extra well. I'm in PEI. I was just wondering, how do I cook these? Oh, right, but it's in the pan. Put it inside, boom. I don't know if that kind of thing will ever happen to me again, but as I was cooking them over the fire in some potato field that night, I realized the rareness of these types of interactions, which are for the most part lost in this modern society and wish I saw more instances of this type of friendly generosity in today's culture. And as I've heard more than once on the East Coast, there's truly nothing like a Canadian. And I couldn't agree more.
Unfortunately, cyclists are required to get a shuttle across a 12-kilometer Confederation bridge, which brought me across the Northumberland Strait straight into my fourth province of the trip. Nouveau Brunswick, the province where you can speak half Francais and half English and the main sentence and get away with it. Sans problem. It started with me arriving late, one windy evening at Murray Beach Provincial Park, where I was nicely put up in a cabin they had. They literally probably saved me from getting my tent ripped to shreds in a gale that night. It's the hurricane bringing it in with winds and rain. The next days were scorchers, 30 degrees Celsius, but often had a very strong breeze coming through. Then, cycling along the New Brunswick coast, I met up with my number one fans, the Wilsons. These absolutely adorable kids waited an entire hour outside in the hot sun I can't keep up with to make sure that they would not miss me arriving. High five! <laughs> Whoa! I was kindly hosted at the Wilsons for that night, taught the girls how to do a backflip during which Mackenzie lost a tooth. And finally went on my way, only to be met with a torrential rainfall. Boy, on the my friend Paul, who happened to be taking some time out on the coast to write a book, met up with me, and instead of taking a ride to stay legit as possible, I threw my bags in his car and drafted it. I hit my land speed record of 82 kilometers an hour going downhill that day. I've never gone so fast in my entire life. Let's go, we had a blast exploring the coast of New Brunswick, getting me to see more places with this trademark open hatch drafting system, letting us an average of 50 kilometers an hour. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I crowned him the draft king. I got to even watch part of the FIFA World Championships that were happening at that time, right out of the trunk. And France actually won that year. Eventually, Paul had to spend some time actually focusing on writing his book, and I went on towards Campbellton. On the way there, I stopped to take some photos of the sunset, and a man named Alan stopped to see if I was okay. He had just finished crossing Canada by bicycle, and that night, he and his wife ended up posting me. Once again, minutes before, I had no idea where I was going to sleep that night, but I trust I was being taken care of. Before I knew it, I woke up and was fed an amazing breakfast, a perfect way to begin my last day in New Brunswick, and biked over to the J.C. Van Horn Bridge into another province and another time zone. I've never been so excited to re-enter Quebec in my life. Crossing the bridge from Camelton, New Brunswick to Pointe à la Croix, Quebec, I realized that it had been my first time to be in Quebec in a month. Cycling up the Route 132 to get to the St. Lawrence was then one of the most beautiful routes I biked so far in the trip, but also the most rushed, as I had friends who I hadn't seen in weeks waiting for me on the northern coast of the St. Lawrence Seaway to encourage me on my way and do a weekend of camping. Seeing familiar faces that I grew up with was something else. After having spent most of my days in solitude for four weeks, it felt refreshing. Eventually, I made my way to St. Simeon, where I met up with the Great Trail for a video shoot. It was insane. Once it was produced and published, I was getting texts from all sorts of people from back home in Montreal. They were seeing me all over YouTube. From the opportunity with the Great Trail, I reached out to over half a million people with my story. 
Thanks, Great Trail. A couple hundred kilometers later, I hit Quebec City, where my friend Gabriel joined. Hooking his cooking spoon to his bike, he joined me on this adventure of a lifetime for a week or two. Ah, ben c'est bien, vous avez roulé en masse. Demain, on va à Athènes, Montréal. Ouais. OK, ouais. It really helped. Having helped to set up camp and make food, cycling more efficiently, drafting behind each other, and sometimes farm equipment. <laughs> but the most noticeable benefit was having someone to talk to, boost the morale, and I found that the hours of biking in between interesting towns would go much faster than when I was biking alone. All right, got a slow leak. On change a bit, bit. Two minutes, and we're back on the road. It's boiling. It's like 30 degrees out in the sun. The anticipation of being home had been building up for weeks now. And I was so excited to see my family. It took us two days to bike Quebec City to Montreal. And the first thing I did, naturally, was to go to the Orange Julep for a classic Montreal snack. Then I finally got to see my friends who were waiting for me on the street. Let's just say we had a long night. And both Gabriel and I spent our weekends resting up and hanging out with our families. Visiting my grandfather, I kept him in the loop of what was happening, and his acknowledgement made me even more stoked to continue. Nothing can really replace longtime friends from back home. People you've invested years and years of time into friendship with. It was quite the feeling of relief having finally made it back to friends and family. My parents, they even organized a fundraising barbecue, raising a couple hundred dollars more for the causes. Okay, you can do this, okay? <laughs> okay you're gonna do this, okay, boys? You're, you're just finished, do it. After a day or two off the saddle, you, I was primed and ready to go again. Thanks so much. See you in September. <laughs> Feeling like as soon as I got there, I left home, taking along a couple friends for a half day with us, enjoying the little bit of Quebec I had left. Thank you, Michael. From there, we stopped halfway to Ottawa at the Herons, longtime friends of mine. We got roped into playing hockey, beach volleyball, and swimming for the entire rest of the afternoon after biking. Then they fed us a feast that we would never forget and told us amazing stories until late into the night. <laughs> I'm sure he was like, sweat and the world just happened. You know? <laughs> Getting to Ottawa was probably one of the heaviest in rainfall but we had no choice but to push on. Welcome to the Prop Canada Adventure! <laughs> Took the dolly ride of 120k in the dank rain. After all, we had a place to stay that night as the walkers came in a clutch and gifted me this Canada 150 mug that perfectly suited my trip. Thank you so much for having us anyway. Well, please stay alive. Rolling to the capital of the country and biking through was quite the milestone. Seeing the flag flying freely on top of Parliament was quite the sight, as I gained an appreciation for how this country is all stringed together on this one hill. Rideau Ferry was a ton of fun. I biked up through here, down through Nova Scotia. I went to even went. But to how did you bike through the ocean? <laughs> I did, did it. I took a ferry. Yeah. See these parts of the chain when it's really, really shiny. Good to see you. Good to see you. Live in the car. Welcome to the ride. Can you 
The woods hosted us, and I got to bike with a bunch of kids alongside me. Squad roll out! And somehow they got around to convincing me to do a backflip into the water from the bridge. Amy you, showed up. How are you eating? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. How. Have a good summer. Interacting with these kids gave me a direct reminder once again of my goal of bettering the world for this generation and made me realize that kids shouldn't have to fight life-threatening diseases, especially at such a young age. I'm giving it all I got to people who have got everything taken away. And at only a third of the way there, I had to push on to give hope of a healthier life to the kids in need. Getting to Toronto was a breeze, drafting each other closely for max efficiency, biking through a hundred millimeters of rainfall one afternoon, The Highway 7 is dubbed the Killer 7. That's gonna start dripping. So with that, it's gonna start rashing at a road rash. And I found out exactly why. Nearly colliding with a truck one afternoon. Eventually, my time with Gabriel had come to a close. And that's where we split ways. The six, baby. <laughs> I went up north to Schaumburg as he went down south to Toronto. Showing up in Schaumburg, I was welcomed by the entire Hayhoe family that were waiting for me at the end of the drive. <laughs> they killed the fatted calf and I had the tastiest steak I had all summer that night. It was about to get real lonely going to the side of Canada where I barely knew anybody. So, while I was still in Toronto, I hit up Tom and decided for the last time in a while to do stuff I won't be able to do while traveling to the middle of nowhere. Tom gave me the royal tour of Toronto. He lives right next to the CN Tower and even got me to play some team sports, a rarity during summer 2018 for me. The next step in the itinerary was to head north. You're talking Barry, Perry Sound, Key River, Sudbury, and nope, definitely a no-go zone. Wildfires were raging everywhere, and being outdoors for 24 hours every day was a recipe for breathing issues. So naturally, I had to improvise. And conveniently, my uncle, who I've been meaning to visit for a while now, was right in the detour path. Double rainbow, baby! Bruce Peninsula, here I come. And if you've never been there, it's like the Canadian version of the Caribbean. With the water being about 20 degrees cooler. Welcome. Hey, see you, man. Thanks, man. Good to see you, too. I couldn't get over the hospitality here. My aunt and uncle's friends even helped raise more money. We actually have somebody here who traveled very far, probably by far gets a prize for the farthest uh, travel. <laughs> and on top of it, he does that for a great cause. Timmy, can you do me a favor and just simply tell me about yourself? And My son cycled across Canada the other way in 2003. Oh, yeah. He's 49 now. He's a little bit really? older than me. <laughs> yeah, well, good for I, you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Yeah. Near the village, the peaceful village. Reconnecting with my cousin, Playing bocce on the cliffside, I could have stayed in Lion's Head for a lifetime. Bocce ball! But eventually, I needed to bike north to the tip of the peninsula to take a ferry. Every day you see a girl with zucchinis. <laughs>
Eva, right? <laughs> nice to meet you. You too. Awesome. <laughs> Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> And that is how to meet strangers and play a game of Ultimate Frisbee. That was a really fun game. Now I gotta go catch that ferry quick. There's this Christian youth camp that I attended and helped out at in the past summers that was also happening that same weekend. So I popped in, surprising my buddy Jack, to help out. After that weekend of socialization, it was goodbye to my friends for real. As Lake Superior is the largest freshwater lake in the world by surface area, and I would have to cycle around it. Solitude. Absolute peace of mind and tranquility of spirit as I made my way towards it. And up I went. Come on! Let's go, boys! Cycling compared to driving can get quite a bit noisier. And the roads can get unpredictable with construction and detours. Construction, construction, construction! Well, I don't mind to slow down anymore. So sometimes the ultimate remedy is to head off the road every now and then. And does it ever make a difference? Being in nature, for me, clears the mind, reduces the risk of danger, and brings me closer to myself. Sometimes it even affects the type of people you get to meet along the way. How many days does it take to uh, raise a barn like that? One day. One day? Wow. That's crazy. What's your name, by the way? I'm Jacob. I'm Timothy. Timothy Joseph. Timothy Joseph. Yeah. Up next to Lake Superior, I got to feel some of that great lake wind. And there were forest fires in this area as well, which left the sun in a kind of a hazy blur. I found my home. And I don't need more money or faster car, no. Don't need a magazine to call me a superstar, no. I'm gonna take this little house and make a home. Beautiful morning in Pancake Bay, and I'm loving life. It's in my heart, I hear Spain. Oh, it makes you want to go in for a dip. And on my face, I feel it breathe. Next to me, two by land, by air, by sea. And that is how it's supposed to be. Now, and that much I can say. Now, nah. 
And this is where my shoe decided to fail on me. I couldn't be further from a bike store to get a new pair. So I did what any logical Canadian would do to fix any problem ever. Go to the closest Canadian tire and fix it with duct tape. The all new Gorilla Tape piece of crap. It worked so well that I ended up taping both shoes. See, I'm not the only crazy one doing this kind of thing. After a couple double doubles, I hopped on my bike and headed to White River. Then Marathon. And World Vision, he's biking across Canada. It's okay, they told me to close the best site available for you. Oh yeah, sick, yes. thanks so much. Okay. where I saw one of the nicest sunsets of the trip. Terrace Bay. Nipping in. These tiny towns sound as if they're places that have absolutely nothing to do in them, and the dullest people. But that couldn't be further from the truth. They have the nicest people, and I met so many interesting characters just by being out there. I've finally gotten closer to the um, Superior, and lately, Lake Superior is actually freezing. Dropped eight degrees from this morning. I'm shivering in this, which is my only sweater now. I might have to put on my windbreaker. In the last town before hitting Thunder Bay, I was climbing this amazingly steep hill and decided I would try to find an unusual camping spot on top of it. And that is what's amazing about not having a set spot to camp every night. You gotta wake up to views like this. The next morning was rough though. I had ran out of food, I got a flat tire on the way there, and it was raining. But I couldn't let anything get to me. That simply was not an option. This tiny little shard of metal. I swapped out the inner tube quickly and made it to the next Timmy's on the road as soon as I could, just like any other Canadian. As soon as I got in, a trucker that saw me biking a few kilometers before ushered me to the front of the line and bought me breakfast. That day, I learned that even though I was having a bad time that morning with just about every setback in the book, I pressed on and at the end of the road there was something positive waiting for me. You got some straight stretches coming up that you're gonna go, what? You might want to stop and ask the construction guy, listen, how do I get over on that new pavement that bypass? Thunder Bay. I was supposed to arrive sometime in the evening, but as per usual, arrived late into the night. Yes, give her. <laughs> Luckily hosted by an online community of cyclists called Warm Showers. This wasn't the first time I was hosted by this sort of thing. And I ended up saying two nights. So one of them's a driver and the other one's a horn blower? Spending the next day cycling in a side-by-side -side buddy bike with my host. Oh, shoot. Oh, so close. Third time's a charm. I couldn't be more thankful to the people I met along the way and the people I know for supporting me as I crossed into one more time zone westward. I started way out there at the tip and then made my way and right now we're right there.
Time to do the rest. Cheers. This was my first time in Central Daylight Time, and also the most west I've been other than Niagara Falls. And I was truly in a spot where I knew nobody. A place called Heministiquia? Yeah, I never heard of it either. A long shot all the way to Winnipeg. At a town called Emo, I had to make a decision. Bike directly to Winnipeg through the USA, saving 100 kilometers, or take a hit and bike longer through Canada. Staying in Canada was a mindset I had adopted since the beginning, so this one was a no-brainer. This is the coolest thing ever. It's a totem pole with books in it. So cool. Riding straight north, I was cycling amongst endless archipelagos coming out of the fresh water. I rode all the way up to Kenora. At a water break along the way, I met Barbara, a lady whose daughter was battling cancer. She gifted me a $100 prepaid credit card, specifically to pay for running costs on the trip. Two days later, probably the most important part of my bike, the freewheel hub, broke. And guess how much that cost? Yep, 100 bucks. Being at your wit's end, when things turn out that badly and you feel something, like a power outside your control, reach into your life and give a helping hand at times like these, that's one of the reasons I believe in something higher than myself. Once I hit Winnipeg, I had some of the best times with people I hadn't seen in 20 years. I took a break day in Altona, just south, where I knew some good people, one of whom was a horse trainer. This is real. <laughs> Are these two friends? <laughs> and as goes with all good ideas I have, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I mounted Rue bareback. She hadn't been ridden in months, all to get bucked off as soon as we reached an empty field. <laughs> You're going wild. <laughs> How do I catch him? I learned that day from Kezia that riding horses is a lot different than riding a bike. I hung out with some friends, the Harmons, for a day's rest and was soon headed back onto the road, westward, prepared for the worst that the prairies had to offer me. I've done this before. So tell me, darling. Once again, what you say and what you swore? Cause the sight line goes over the tree line, Lord. And so Holy moly, that is epic. We got trouble. You got we got trouble. Just for a fun storm here. I just saw lightning. Miles around, you never see it because you're nowhere near. I was in Saskatchewan. I'd made it to the land everybody calls the flattest place on earth. The sea. Oh, oh, the way to me. After a few days of cycling in, I met an indigenous guy around my age who had also lost his grandmother to cancer and seemed pretty moved by my story of what I was doing as we talked. After we parted ways, around 10 minutes later, the same guy pulled over in front of me and running over, reached out and gave me this tobacco prayer tie. His grandmother had given it to him before passing away to offer him protection and good luck, and he decided to pass it on to me. Personally, it was the greatest sign of togetherness of those affected by this disease the whole trip. I don't know if I'll ever meet this guy again, but the sincerity in his gesture stay with me to this day. As does his grandmother's gift.
My view was really all flatness for 1,500 kilometers. All the flatness in the world. All the company from herds of cattle and occasional farm machinery I can draft behind left me in good company during the prairies. This train wants a race! What are you? Caribou. There's literally a large house coming my way. There's a home on the, on the road. Harvest boys, get her! Red basket of Canada, right here, right here. Okay, listen here, you have no idea how frustrating it is biking on this. I'm not going anywhere! It's just sky. It's just ground and sky, that's it. Forever. When does it end? Come on. And you continue seeing the same car for two minutes and he's going 110 kilometers an hour. I don't know, man. Oh, oh it's far, bro. I'm telling you, there hasn't been a curve in the road for the past Rolling into Cairnport, I was shown the definition of camaraderie as my friend Nathaniel walked out to the edge of town to greet me at the end of my late night cycle. He proceeded to introduce me to numerous people, all curious as to how I even got there. The next morning, Laura and friends took care of me with an amazing pancake breakfast. And at lunch, I met even more folks. This girl named Michaela happened to be just visiting, and just like that, I now know someone who lives in southern Alberta. This really is the middle of nowhere, in the middle of Saskatchewan. of a wheat field in Saskatchewan. Today I'm going to Alberta. I'm seeing Saskatchewan is still. Sun's coming out, so sun's out, guns out, boys. Kidding. I have five layers on. Only in Saskatchewan, folks. Only in Saskatchewan. Woo. I think I'm in Berta, but I don't even know. Looks like there's some signs like five days ahead. I'll let you know when I get there. Is that a sign? I think we might be getting to Berta. There is a sign. It's Berta. It happened more than once, you know, that news would be passed on westward and a couple hundred kilometers away, someone I had just briefly met or only knew of would gladly have a place for me to stay or show me around their town. Truly, sometimes it felt as if I was biking between the cities and homes of family members. One of the first things I saw upon crossing the provincial line into Alberta was an F-150 almost hitting me. I couldn't have asked for a more genuine welcome to Berta. Once I hit Medicine Hat, I had another decision to make. To either go north or south, Banff or Crow's Nest Pass. Either choice would yield beautiful views. But it was when an early October snowstorm came through Calgary that I decided to miss it and go south through the Crow's Nest Pass. So both of my spares don't work. The brand new spare in the box has a hole in it. Hmm. 
And the culprit is tiny shard of metal here. This has caused me a bit of grief. My hands are so nasty right now. Arriving in Lethbridge, I got in touch with my friend Michaela, who I met at Karenport, and her family took me in with such a warm welcome that I just couldn't leave the next morning. So I stayed an extra day, and she showed me around Lethbridge and the stunning coulees. <laughs> The experiences I had with people I met along the way were extraordinary. On the bottom line, I would say it all boils down to opening yourself up to others and they'll open themselves up to you. So let us knock. Hi there. That was kind of random, but I'm biking across Canada for uh -huh. for kids' cancer and yep. World Vision. I was wondering if I can just camp in your backyard. Sure. Yeah, I just don't want to get combined in the morning. Like. Oh no, no, I don't blame you. Are you hungry? I'd be double at Seidel. That'd be really cool. Well, come in. Awesome. Thanks so much. I'm Timmy, by the way. Oh, I'm Robin. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Two minutes later. <laughs> I love Canada. I just love it. What a blessing. What's up? Who's a cute dog? Yeah, I made some friends. I wonder how far they'll follow me. And these are the most loyal dogs ever. Come and say bye to me. There's a couple peaks over there too. Woo! After more than a few weeks of crossing the flat plains, it was finally time to conquer something that had once haunted me, but now made me so excited that I simply couldn't wait to climb them. The Rockies. There they were, these geographic giants that I had seen as a challenge my entire youth. A mountain range bigger than life. Getting closer! Another hundred kilometers later, and I was in the Crow's Nest Pass. Welcome to the Rocky Mountains. And I'm going that direction. At the foot of the mountain range, the wind gusted high, I have never and I took on before. my first ascent. I took it as a warning, and as a welcome to the mountain range. And so you see what I've been telling you. It's nothing like it seems, it's what I've been telling you. Will you learn what I mean? It's amazing. There's an actual crow saying bye to me as I exit. That's pass. See you, buddy. Thanks for letting me use your path. <laughs> That's really cool. Here he goes. See ya, crow. No one's heard that one. Oh man. Bye.
Last province, last time I had to climb a sign. Let's go, baby! I had never taken on a feat so large in my life, and this would prove to be one of the hardest obstacles to surmount on the trip so far. On my first full day biking through the Rockies, I found myself not needing to listen to any podcasts or music at all. I just looked around in awe, and it's as if the mountains are speaking instead. That night, I stealth camped, but apparently, bears like stealth camping too. Would have been safe and right beside us. <laughs> right beside a grizzly, eh? Yeah. As the days got busier and more challenging with cycling, I eventually rounded the band into Kimberly and was hosted by Podsy, a bike touring legend who heard of me from other cyclists. I'd say about 95% of the kilometers done during this trip so far were either on asphalt roads or nicely paved shoulder of a highway. And to spend a bit more time in nature, I had the bright idea of pedaling the Great Creek Pass. The Great Creek Pass, after doing a little bit of research right here, is actually pretty nuts. It's one of the highest passes, like ro mountain roads in Canada at 6,800 feet. I started on this trail later in the afternoon, which starts off as a bad idea. The signs were saying that it was bound to be a pretty neat adventure, and I wasn't worried. I had climbed hills like this before my bike, I think. Well, on paved roads at least. I really shouldn't be putting my bike through this, but oh well. This terrain was a little unpredictable, and is where I really wished I had a fat bike. And with the sun setting fast, and still a bit to go to the summit, I took the executive decision to spend the night at the top. 6,800 feet, I'm camping up here. But yeah, basically, uh, no signal. I didn't tell anyone I was spending an extra night out in the wild, so I really hope no one gets worried. I woke up to quite the surprise the next morning. A fresh blanket of snow. Finally, I could see what kind of friends came to visit that night. Heard about the summer snow. When it falls on you, the blood runs cold. But don't you sweat the breeze skin. Cause it melts away for it sinks yeah. in. And you dream about this very night. When the moon runs down the summer sky. Oh, Could yeah. be the morning of the spring. There's something special about this place. Complete serenity. Just getting out there, not seeing anyone for hours and hours at a time. Just you and the mountains. I'll never forget the feeling I had going through Grey Creek Pass. I think everyone should experience this kind of peaceful terrain, just to get in the wild a bit. Out of all the sections of the Great Trail that I've been on, this one is my favorite. Oh yeah. Oh no. Oh, cool. 
So this is what supports the heaviest of my bags on this one and doink. It's already a splint on this one with trusty duct tape, zip tie, and tent pegs. After absolutely flying down the other end of the mountain into Kootenai Bay, I caught the first ferry across Kootenai Lake, right into Balfour, to enter my final time zone. September 30th. We're crossing to my last time zone over this lake. Woo! This finish line feels like the longest one I've ever had to cross. I cycled through Willow Point and onto Nelson, where I spent my first night in the Pacific time zone. I was really in the thick of it now. The terrain always seemed to have a climb or a hill to it. Never a dull moment. I met Will from England on that stretch and we ended up cycling together for two days. Soyuz, Canada's only desert. I biked north towards the Okanagan Valley, smelling wine grapes as I passed through the winemaking capital of Canada. And was it ever a sweet coincidence that I got to spend Thanksgiving weekend with some friends who I hadn't seen in forever? This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Bye girls, thank you so much. Pushing further into the southern interior of BC, I felt as if everyone that met me did so with purpose. Random people would pull over and give me gifts of food and host me. Truly again, I was being taken care of. From the Okanagan Valley to the Pacific, I had under 500 kilometers of some of the most beautiful road cycling Canada has to offer. So I just enjoyed. Every time I would see something beautiful, I would stare into it, digesting every last detail as I cycled past it, slowly, ever changing my perspective into the towering mountains. While I was cycling through the beautiful Manning Park, I met up with Celine from France, who was also cycling across Canada. She had access to a beautiful resort with the works, which was a pretty nice change from my tent. The next day of cycling was pretty significant. So here I am at the summit of the last mountain I had to climb. It's all downhill. And it truly felt like I was going downhill for the rest of the trip. I cruised right into the Fraser Valley and the views kept on coming.
Biking to Chilliwack, I visited my friend Matt. He took me on an adventure, finding the coldest water we could find to jump in. Welcome to my backyard! Later, buddy. Love you, bro. Thanks for stopping by. Finish strong. Thanks, bro. The morning bikes at this time in the trip were getting colder and colder. One last ticket before it's gone. One last summer before it's fall. But it didn't matter because this was my last day biking, or so I thought. Yup, it must have been the seventh or eighth missed ferry of the trip. However, there was something relaxing about it. Suddenly having all plans diverted to the next day gave me time to breathe deeply. I'm at the finish line and have come so far these past four months. I had a unique adventure the entire summer and a nature of freedom that I had been waiting for my whole life. It was time to trace the places I've gone, reflect on the things learnt, and to cherish the beauty witnessed over the past four months. The end of the day had approached, so I pulled over into some random farmer's field and crashed. I started the trip camping, and I'll end it camping too. Too many days in the darkness Without a glimpse of the light Running tired and broken and scared But I swear I'll never give up the fight with only 20 kilometers or so to go, I got up before the sun and began biking towards the coastline. Nearing Victoria, Jim, a retired columnist and avid cyclist who noticed how much gear I had, simply started chatting with me on the road. He shared a wealth of information with me about Victoria as we cycled closer and closer to my goal. A flock of Canada geese flew overhead just as I reached it. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. I've never felt anything like it, really. Shortly after 8 a.m. on October 14th, I had reached mile zero. I got some pictures taken with the sign and with Terry Fox at his memorial. He had been an inspiration my entire life and is a beacon of hope for the cure. Then, it was time. This is about the most meaningful thing I've ever done in my life. It's full flash, she said. Making my way to the western edge of where I could go had more of a dead end shock than I had expected. Completing something I had been working towards for over four months and literally biking right to the edge was emotional and a feeling I'll keep with me forever. And the thing I wanted Grandpa to know the most was that I love him and that his battle isn't fought alone. But more importantly is knowing that with the help of countless people, the journey wasn't just mine, but shared amongst all who donated and helped along the way. It felt like the end of an age for me, and also the beginning of a new era. 
I was at the end of the trail, mile zero, the western end of the country. The cycling was over, but the victory lap had just started. It so happened that Moren, oh, a German traveler I had met 4,000 kilometers prior in Ontario, was arriving in Victoria on the same day I was. So I stored my bike, hopped into her converted van, and we drove to Chifino. We celebrated and surfed arguably the best spots in Canada, and I couldn't have asked for a better wind down of a trip. Eventually, it was time to prepare to go back home. After dropping off my bike at the airport, I met up with Jackie and Gabby, friends I'd met on the island, who showed me around Vancouver. We hit the town and did I ever celebrate. We did so until next morning where I headed off to catch my early flight home. Good morning from YVR. I'm exhausted but I'm coming home. <laughs> what took me months and half a million calories later cycling one way is now only taking a couple hours flying over the Rockies and then the Plains and then Ontario and finally all the way back home, Montreal.
My grandfather's condition was worsening rapidly during their last weeks of my trip, and I couldn't wait to see him. So the first place I went was directly where he was. He was stoked and called his friend right away to say I made it alive. Shaking his hand, I felt the most genuine thankfulness I'd felt in my life and the strongest connection I'd felt with him. Within a month of my return, my grandfather Henri passed away at 99 years old. He lived a long life, and I am grateful for the memories I have of him. And the possibility of doing this for him while he was still alive is priceless. My only regret being that my grandmother never knew about me going coast to coast for cancer, so I brought the coasts to her. What's done, is done. Before the trip, I had a slight hesitation, asking my work for that much time off or whether I should train a little bit more before I leave. But I felt this hunch that this was the right time to do this kind of thing, a once in a lifetime experience. So if you're to take something from this, I'd say it would be to show people around you that you love them. You never know when it could be too late. The world needs more people like you to make it a better place. World Vision needs you. The Sick Kids Foundation needs you, as do countless other great organizations. I could have made up whichever excuse not to bike across Canada, but that's not what's up. I believe life's too short to spend it saying, I might do, or I could have done. So get out there, get out of your comfort zone, and just send it.